Dr. Ely is indeed very well qualified for this assignment, having first met Leonard in 1990 as a summer fellow at the Institute of Humane Studies, where no doubt many others met him too, and were also deeply influenced by him for the rest of their lives. Lenore later wrote that, from this time onwards, Leonard has been a presence in my life, an ever ready resource and an inspiration. It has been one of the great blessings of my life to have had the opportunity to work with Leonard in a variety of settings to advance the learning of liberty. I know that if Leonard was here now, he would be beaming broadly, chuckling, and just delighted at her acknowledgement of his contribution to her outstanding career advancing the learning of liberty. Her achievements are however so extensive and continuing that I only have time to mention a very few. Um, she earned her bachelor's degree in science education from Oberlin University, a master's in history from the University of Alabama, a master's and PhD in history from the John Hopkins University. Since then, she's held program management positions at the Heritage Foundation, the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, and the Milton and Rose Friedman Foundation for Educational Choice. She has served as an affiliated senior scholar with the Mercator Center at George Mason. Pretty good record, I think, isn't it? And as a founding board member of Project KID, which was created to provide respite childcare in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, and she's very practical as well. She's a founding president of the philanthropic enterprise that seeks to strengthen understanding of how philanthropy and voluntary social cooperation promote human flourishing and has served as president and is currently the very energetic secretary of the Philadelphia Society. From 2019 to 21, she served as senior fellow communities with the Charles Koch Institute. And while there, and much like Leonard had at IHS, she has played a key communicator role, role some of the fruits of which will be seen later today with the Atlas Stand Together collaboration. Ely has co-edited three books, the most recent of which is Commerce and Community, um, Ecologies of Social Cooperations, published by Routledge, and she's published widely in scholarly publications. And now she is on to a new and very important chapter in her life, as she becomes a key part of the leadership team at the University of Francisco Maricam for the next phase of its growth, along with Ricardo Cayo Castillo, who may be here. Um, she will now address a very important and topical issue. Once more, liberalism and some problems of historical transmission between the generations. Lenore, all our best wishes go with you to UFM, and we look forward to hearing from you in the future. Thank you very much. Welcome, Lenore. Okay, there we go. Good morning. Linda, thank you for that very generous introduction. I appreciate it. It's a special honor for me to be introduced by you, especially because I just heard your presidential address at the Mont Pelerin Society in which you used the same quotation that inspired the title for my talk, this quotation from Hayek's uh, essay on the intellectuals and socialism. I also want to express my thanks to Brad Lips and the Atlas team for this opportunity to address you as the ninth presenter of the annual Ligio Memorial Lecture. It's an honor to join my predecessors in remembering our friend and mentor, Leonard Ligio. And I want to thank those of you for being here this morning. I hope you have your coffee. I'm not here to give you answers, but to invite you into a conversation, so stay awake. If I look to Hayek for the title of my remarks, it's been to Leonard Ligio's historical and legal scholarship, his mentoring of countless scholars and political activists over the years, and his kind and pacific personality that have inspired the themes of my remarks. I first met Leonard when I arrived at IHS as a summer research fellow in 1990, and as Linda mentioned, I've had many opportunities to work with Leonard through other activities over the years. This morning, I want to share with you some questions that have been on my mind about the relationships between liberalism and democracy, about the transmission of liberalism within the complex tapestry of historical experience, and about the roles of philanthropy and entrepreneurship in the evolution of social institutions. I think these are questions Leonard would love to discuss, so I trust he is listening in. I want to start with an assertion. The success of liberalism depends on doing more than merely once more getting our philosophical ideas right. 
I believe we must also do more to transmit to future generations not only our ideas, but also the desire to participate in a living tradition of entrepreneurial liberalism. What is the liberal orientation to being in the world, and how do we best sustain and renew a liberal tradition? The liberal worldview rests on respect for the dignity of people and their capability to take responsibility for their own lives despite the challenges of the human condition. It also calls us to intellectual humility, respecting the limitations of human nature. Recognizing the necessity of social cooperation, liberal systems of self-governance, which we too often equate with democracy, require us to place additional constraints upon ourselves. Such formal constraints may be born in revelation, such as the thou shalt nots of the biblical decalogue, or custom as by the common law adjudication of disputes, or through legal theory as in the, the philosophical pr principle of non-aggression. We may fix these constraints in laws and constitutions, but as Alexis de Tocqueville reminded us, the principles and practices that sustain liberty are only realized in history when they become the habits of the heart of a people. As the democratic age dawned, I'm not sure where we aim. Ah, there we go. As the democratic age dawned, Tocqueville envisioned the possibility that democracies would drift away from freedom. As the democratic age may be coming to a close, I will leave to each of you to consider the symptoms of this demise Tocqueville's concerns continue to haunt us. For what comes in the wake of democracy? Tocqueville thought it would be some form of despotism, and history seems to be realizing his prophetic fear. We hoped that the triumph of democracy over colonialism would bring advances in human freedom. Nevertheless, history has revealed to us story after story of promising democratic starts that soon gave way to illiberal dictatorships. In Africa and Latin America especially, democratic processes continue to bring socialist-minded leaders to power. Why does this happen? Are young democracies fragile because they have bad ideas, bad institutions? Or is it because new democratic citizens have not yet cultivated the deeply rooted and intergenerational habits of self-constraint that democratic governance requires? And what of the long-standing liberal democracies of, democracies of Europe and the United States, which are no longer drifting but are rushing headlong into softer despotisms? Why does a nation such as the United States, where liberty, equality, and prosperity blossomed, become a welfare warfare state guided primarily by social democratic values? Where do we go from here? If the experience of Europe is any guide, established liberal democracies are going to be followed by some form of global governance structures managed by enlightened technocrats and humanitarians who know better what is good for the rest of us. Is this sort of constitutional drift inevitable? Is the advance of liberty always to be just a short ride up one side of a Ferris wheel, followed as rapidly by the descent? and a need once more, as Hayek says, to push the wheel back to the ascending motion? Does our liberal philosophy help us to understand how we might escape such cycles of history? Perhaps we need the historical way of thinking to help guide us through the end of democracy and to discover a more steadily ascending path for human flourishing. In a 1992 essay on the importance of political traditions, Leonard Liggio reminded us that a historical study is essential to our understanding of contemporary cultural and political problems. He described how the nations of South America and North America developed so differently after 1492, even though both had inherited the political and legal, legal and political institutions of medieval Europe. What made a Bolivar's legacy so different from the legacy of Washington? Why is one the liberator and one the father of his country? Ligio observed, quoting the historian Harold Berman, that even where democracies thrived in the Americas, they largely abandoned the law-creating role of the judiciary, and they exalted the role of legislatures. Only the U.S. Constitution, he wrote, with its deliberate recourse to medieval English institutions, staved off democracy's drift for a while. 
Such study of comparative historical institutions is essential to the advance of liberty. But how much more might the historical way of thinking, rooted in humility and curiosity about our place in the flow of time, improve the ways we live out our liberal principles? Can the historical way of thinking deepen our theory of human action? Can it help us better sustain a liberal tradition and transmit it to future generations? The English historian Herbert Butterfield was the teacher of my teacher, John Pocock. He was also the author of The Whig Interpretation of History, a book in which he called upon the historian to try to understand human action in its own historical context and contingency. He argued that historians must avoid presentism, interpreting the past as though the actions of its actors aimed at us. To approach our lives with historical awareness is to be open to exploring both the continuities and discontinuities we have with the past. Through the historical way of thinking, we come to better know ourselves. We learn to participate in keeping alive the traditions that are the core operating systems of our civilizations, and we prepare ourselves to recognize when either drift or revolutionary conditions necessitate creative and courageous action. Good historical inquiry can also help us declare decisively that some ideas and institutions are more conducive to human betterment than others. Refusing to take a Whiggish view of history, as if we can see the causal steps in time's arrow, invites us to delve more deeply to understand the processes by which historical institutions and civilizations rise and fall. In the Reed Lecture he delivered at Cambridge University in 1971, Butterfield speculated on the discontinuities between the generations in history. In this essay, he imaginatively explored the question of how a people loses liberty. I'm going to ask you to read this passage along with me. I think it's worth the moment of time it will take. It seems, Butterfield wrote, that liberty is greatly prized by those who are struggling for it or who have recently lost it. But those who have inherited it come to depreciate it for it can be a bother and an inconvenience. Some people are bored with anything of the sort, and at any rate, the other man's freedom, well, everybody else's freedom, can be a nuisance to any of us. More important still, he continues, once you possess liberty, you acquire the feeling that that particular problem is behind you, and you turn your real longings now to something else, something which is all the more valuable to you because you do not possess it. Having set your heart on this further object, you can convince yourself that liberty is mere luxury. And then it becomes very easy to surrender to a Messiah who says he will give you the thing that you are now really wanting. It becomes all the more easy in that you are siding with a winner. For the time being, you gain your object and the loss of liberty falls on the other party. In reality, this liberty that is being sacrificed is the freedom to choose your objective in the next stage in the story. It is the thing that brings men closest to a mastery over their own destiny. Let's look at that last sentence again. For Butterfield, the freedom to choose our objective in the next stage in the story is the liberty that is meaningful. So it's occurred to me to ask, does Butterfield shed light for us on Hayek's puzzle in his essay on the intellectuals and socialism as to why socialism gains momentum across the generations and why he asserts that liberalism must be made to appeal once more? Let's look at Hayek's statement in a larger context. We must make the building of a free society once more an intellectual adventure, a deed of courage. What we lack, he writes, is a liberal utopia a program which seems neither a mere defense of things as they are, nor a diluted kind of socialism, but a truly liberal radicalism which does not spare the susceptibilities of the mighty, which is not too severely practical, and which does not confine itself to what appears today to be politically possible. My intellectual journey with classical liberalism began with Hayek's essay on the use of knowledge in society. So it's hard for me to admit that I struggle with the use we have made of the essay, The Intellectuals and Socialism, across our community. My concerns are many, but essentially I think Hayek here stumbled on the fundamental challenge of reconciling liberalism as political philosophy and liberalism as a tradition of lived experience. 
As readers of Hayek, we know that when men believe with a fatal conceit that they have the capacity to plan a utopian renewal of the world, trouble often begins. The classical liberal certainly believes that working for social and policy reform is necessary, but I think Hayek missteps slightly when he suggests that what we need to win people to these ideas and reforms is a liberal utopia, a comprehensive program that can compete for public opinion with the socialist utopias on offer everywhere. A utopia is, of course, no place. And aren't our hopes for liberalism that we can do more to make our lives better in this place? What led Hayek to call for a utopian vision for liberalism? In The Intellectuals and in Socialism, Hayek proposed that socialist ideals appeal to a certain type of historical actor he calls the intellectuals, the professional secondhand dealers in ideas that we discuss, whose influence over public opinion in the modern world has grown so strong that they have become the governing force of politics. Hayek does not attribute evil motives to the intellectual class, but observes how the visionary character of socialist utopianism serves as a powerful pull. And so he proposes liberalism, liberalism needs some form of similar imaginative vision. For over 70 years now, classical liberals have read Hayek's essay as a sort of recipe for how to advance the philosophical foundations of a free society. We talk about the structure of social change as if we have a linear formula for converting ideas into policy. And we've built up an extensive network of organizations, many of them here today, seeking to counter the entrenched influence of the intellectuals. Nevertheless, we have not seemed to loosen the allure of collectivist ideals. So what if Hayek's call for a liberal intellectual class bearing the standard for a liberal utopianism misses the mark? What if liberalism must in fact be transmitted between the generations through a living tradition of political and entrepreneurial experience rather than pulled forward by an unrealizable utopian vision? Wouldn't this possibility actually align better with Hayek's trenchant insights about spontaneous orders, the evolution of social institutions such as law and language, and the indispensable centrality of local knowledge in the processes of social cooperation? There seem to remain tensions in, the class, in classical liberal thought between the need for liberal idealism and the necessity of liberal action grounded in the freedom that we all should have to choose our own objective in the next stage in the story. What if it's not a liberal utopianism, but a deeper understanding of the roles of culture and community in the processes of historical change that will help us better attract future generations away from socialism's redemptive promises of security, solidarity, and salvation? Can we invite people step by step onto a path of different, more liberal-oriented choices? I think so, but this is more likely to happen alongside them in community, as Robert Enloe just, just mentioned about you know, working with people in the field in the school choice movement. It's going to happen more in community than in the, political, in the trenches of political warfare. In Hayek's essay, there's another actor who appears briefly, and we haven't paid much attention to him in analyzing this essay, theoretically. This is the practical man of affairs. Hayek's not very generous in this essay to the practical men, suggesting that their deep distrust of theoretical speculation attracts them to what is politically possible instead of engaging them as supporters of a more systemic policy for freedom worked out by scholars. Here, we enter a debate enjoined by Ligio's longtime colleague, Murray Rothbard. For decades, Rothbard called for a strategy of building up a libertarian hardcore to advance the political goals of liberalism. Disdaining gradualism in theory, this hardcore would hold out only for radical principle changes. Rothbard properly noted that ideas do not spread and advance by themselves in a social vacuum. They must be adopted and spread by people people who must be convinced of and committed to the progress of liberty. He thus argued that the advancement of liberty requires a movement as well as a body of ideas. Unfortunately, the strategy of advancing a radical general system through a utopian liberal movement sits in philosophical and practical tension with the necessity people face to make a living and make a life in the world. Is there a better way to understand the processes of historical change? 
A simple public choice analysis suggests that intellectuals gain influence in part because they capture the social institutions that provide them a living. From the platforms of the universities, the media, the halls of legislative power, they become the largest voice in public affairs. It is in their interest to shore up their influence in these institutions by excluding their critics. Perhaps this, more than the utopian appeal of socialism, accounts for the reason that since the early 20th century, liberal scholars have found it increasingly difficult to make a life or a living in the institutions that shape public opinion. This meant that their work had to depend upon the buildup of new institutions, and thus ironically upon the philanthropy of the practical men of affairs, the successful entrepreneurs who make their livings through the daily work of creating value by meeting the material and cultural demands of consumers. In focusing too much on the limitations of the practical men and their tendency to settle for gradual reforms in politics over radical revolutions, Hayek and Rothbard both seem to me to pass over the indispensable and strategic role of the entrepreneur in affecting the changes in society that people will either adopt or ignore in the marketplace. Classical liberal scholars have, of course, deeply analyzed entrepreneurship, and we often celebrate the entrepreneurs among us. In this audience, we recount the remarkable story of Sir Anthony Fisher's life, for example, admiring the young entrepreneur whose concerns with the advance of collectivism in Britain led him to discover the writings of Hayek, to learn new methods of chicken, far chicken farming from Baldy Harper, and ultimately to found the institutions that would give birth to Atlas Network. But we need to more deeply theorize the role of entrepreneurs in shaping the evolution of social institutions. Through their innovations and services to people, entrepreneurs shape the very landscape within, within which people choose their objectives in the next stage in the story. And so it matters very much what the entrepreneur believes about the nature of men and the nature of his own power in the world, especially when he turns to philanthropic causes. Why do some practical men, Anthony Fisher, Pierre Goodrich, Manuel Ayao, Jimmy Lai, we heard yesterday, readily see how collectivism constrains liberty and decide to devote their entrepreneurial energy and philanthropy to combat it? And why are so many more seduced by the humanitarian impulse that partners with malinvestment in constructivist social change? Far from dismissing the practical men, liberalism needs to understand how to draw more of them into delving beneath the shadows and mirrors of public opinion into deeper conversations about the full scope of liberty and its benefits. For over a decade, I had the pleasure of working alongside Dick Cornell and thinking through some of these challenges. Much as Leonard Ligio called our attention to the need for a deeper understanding of the Western tradition, Western legal tradition, Dick called for classical liberals to better understand humanity's very deep needs for community, which underscores the prominent and problematic role of philanthropy in the Western tradition. In 1991, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, Cornell published an essay called New Work for Invisible Hands proposing that with the collapse of Soviet communism, classical liberals would immediately need to confront the social democracy that is swept across the West by working to understand voluntary social process as completely as we understand market process. This meant that we had to try to understand in advance the role of a philanthropic enterprise better informed by liberal principles, rooted in the belief that people must have freedom to choose their objectives in the next stage in the story and recognizing that community is something that emerges when people come together to accomplish things that are important to them and succeed. Only through creative entrepreneurship to connect more people to the market order could we present credible visions of alternatives to the failing programs of centrism. In the decades since Cornell wrote those lines, we have made some progress. As Brad Lips catalogs in his new book, many of you are already in the business of finding entrepreneurial solutions for human betterment but we still seem to be struggling to put the whole package together, to align our language and our theory and our practice into a distinctively liberal strategy that can stand against and hopefully finally turn the prevailing winds of socialism that bear down upon us. This brings us full circle to the problem of once more. Why does it seem that liberalism is once more slipping behind instead of gaining momentum? In part, I think it is because, often in the name of philanthropy, our liberalism has become too entangled with the constructivist and identitarian forms that democracy took in the 20th century. We have romanticized social change, 
and democracy as mere freedom of expression. But this is the very road to serfdom. Hayek knew that to choose one's government did not ensure liberty. And as Vincent Ostrom reminded us, Tocqueville's concern about majority despotism arises when those who exercise the prerogatives of government attempt to cope with all the problems of life, sparing people the cares of thinking and the troubles of living. Can we wrest back these responsibilities of people and communities from today's Leviathans? The hubris of liberal democracy spread a false and even utopian humanitarianism around the world in the 20th century. Today, we need a renewed vision of liberal constitutionalism. We have to embrace the hard work of spreading the ideas and institutions of limited government and rule of law as we always have. More importantly, in my opinion, we must also offer a truly humane and historically perceptive vision that advocates the moral necessity of treating people as free to choose their own objectives in the next stage in the story. As my colleague at UFM, Ramon Perriotta, put it recently, in reflecting on the latest wave of government reactions to the pandemic, Ramon, I hope you'll excuse my English translation of your Spanish, people know how to take care of themselves. They are not stupid. They choose what suits them best according to their current situation, the moment of their life, and the place where they are. To think that the government knows more than they do is fatal arrogance. But we see such fatal arrogance around us, all around us today, with social justice as the end and theories of social change shaping the means, the NGO industrial complex fueled by modern philanthropy and its partnership with the liberal democratic administrative state has largely deconstructed the constitutional arrangements and cultural restraints that define free societies. We need to look more critically upon this hero called the social entrepreneur and his goal of promoting reform without counting the monetary or moral costs. That is not the way to utopia, but to apocalypse. In drawing my remarks to a close, I want to leave you with one big thought and a challenge. The thought is this, the transmission of a liberal tradition must be a task of meaningful historical action toward human betterment rather than the pursuit of utopian dreams. As Brad Lips puts it in concluding his new book, the future belongs to the advocates of authentic liberalism, open and entrepreneurial, inclusive and generous. We seek no end state utopia, but we know that it's through the iterative innovations of free people that societies will continue to enjoy improved standards of living and more opportunities to pursue happiness. And what are tradition and culture but the patterns of ideas, institutions, and habits of the heart that emerge from the innovations and choices that people make in communities? The best philanthropy starts not with the love of mankind, but with the love of what it means to be human. The advance of liberty needs a stable community of people extending through the generations who help one another write their stories in light of the general principles of freedom. So we do have to teach the young these general principles and help them practice their application. I believe no educational institution is doing this better right now than UFM, which I'm honored, which is why I'm honored to be joining the administrative team there. But even the teaching of general principles can only take us so far because they don't always tell us exactly what to do. In a complex social system in which we live, we often face difficult choices with no one right answer. Each of us has responsibilities and we have to make a living in the world, fulfilling commitments to the diverse little platoons we make. Learning how to balance these responsibilities and discharge them cannot be the work of ideas alone. We do need to cast a hopeful vision that can help the practical men, the entrepreneurs and the policymakers among us act on the first anthropological and moral principle of liberalism, which is that humans can live with the freedoms and responsibilities of choice even in conditions of uncertainty and risk. Then we may see in the decisions of everyday life, the principled and the practical converge. I told you at the beginning of my remarks about the important role Leonard Ligio played as a mentor to so many of us. For Leonard, we were not replaceable cogs in a movement, but members of a community of persons in time, bearing the image of God and having unique endowments. Every good mentor I have ever had connected me to a tradition and then challenged me to deepen and in, extend and deepen it in order to accomplish the things I am uniquely here to understand and to do. 
So I ask you now to think about your mentors. Who inspired you to join the adventure of living for liberty? Who has connected you to community, held you accountable when necessary, and helped you find the courage to move forward when the way looks cloudy? To whom do you feel the deepest gratitude? And I challenge you to tell me, whom are you mentoring? With whom are you sharing the stories and the traditions and the ideas that shape your life's work? Are you helping a younger person take up their own role in the story? This is how liberty will be transmitted through the generations. So be like Leonard, be like Jimmy Lai, extend a hand and build these bridges. Thank you very much for your time.